Welcome to Chapter 1, Present Tense Verbs. Uh, I'm assuming that you have uh, gone through the uh, introductory slides and you've gotten down the Greek alphabet as well as the vowels and the way the diphthongs work. With that in mind now, we're going to move on to actually working with Greek verbs. And so let's go on here and let me uh, introduce you first of all to Lou. You can see him there on your screen. Lou uh, is going to be our guide throughout much of our experience uh, learning Greek for the next two terms. Lou gets his name from one of the Greek verbs that you learned this week in your vocabulary list, that is Luo. And he will be here along with some other characters to help us along. Now, one thing that I don't assume when I teach Greek uh, is that people actually remember a whole lot of their grammar uh, when they learn English. I don't expect you to remember all kinds of information about nouns and verbs and adjectives and participles and prepositions, all that stuff that we were supposed to learn back in school and perhaps did, but have long since forgotten. So don't be uh, afraid to think that uh, you need to have a, a degree in English grammar to learn Greek because you don't. In fact, what you may discover, as I did when I learned both Greek and Hebrew, is that my English grammar uh, suddenly made sense to me in a way that it hadn't before. I became a better writer and a better reader because I began to understand grammar again for the first time. Oh, that was really bad again for the first time. Anyway, moving on. Let's take a look at the verbs. Uh, in our basic concepts as we look here, um, verbs do one of three things. Uh, they can state a fact. You can see there, he threw the ball. Or a verb can give a command, as in throw the ball. And a verb can also just simply ask a question will you throw a ball? And all of the words, again, that you learned for this week were verbs, and that's what we're going to deal with primarily. Now, let's meet another character who will be with us throughout this course, and that is Vera Verb. Vera Verb will be the individual character that will help us to understand verbs and how they work. She's our representative. And I want you to notice a few things about Vera. First of all, I want you to see that Vera is a very tense individual. Notice the tears coming off the side of her head. Uh, she has some tense tears, and that's going to help us remember that every verb you study is going to have a different tense. Notice also that coming out of her mouth, her voice, there are electrical amps, the AMP, and that we're going to know that each verb that we learn has a different voice. There's three different possible voices for a verb, and we will look at that again. And notice that she's wearing a mumu dress. Uh, the mumu dress reminds us of the word mood. Okay, And Vera, at times, can be a very moody person. Although you're going to only be introduced to one of her moods throughout this term, you're going to discover that she has many moods. Finally, you'll notice that she's carrying a purse there, that case. That'll help us to remember a uh, person. Okay, that is whether it is a first, second, or third person, and then the number falling out of there. So all of this here is to help us remember the different parts of the verb. Now, let me just say one thing before we move any uh, much further in this uh, lesson. I'm going to lay the groundwork for a lot of different things that are going to keep coming up over and over again throughout the course of this term. I don't expect you to be an expert in all of them. I don't expect you to memorize everything. I will tell you at the end of this lesson what it is exactly you must know. So don't, uh, don't become anxious as I begin going over some of these different things and feel like you need to get them all down. We're going to work together and take our time as we go through this. So with that in mind, let's begin to look at the five different parts that we have here of Vera Verb. And that is, first of all, tense. Every verb that you're going to learn can take on several different tenses. Uh, and you're going to learn, at least this week, just the present tense. And the tense tells us two things about a verb. It tells us the time and the type of the action. It tells us when it happened, whether this action happened in the past, or was it in the present, or was it in the future. And then it tells us what type of action. Was this action simple, that it just was completed at the past? Or was it continuous, ongoing? Or is it something that only happened momentarily? Was the action completed or not? As we go throughout the uh, various tenses that you're going to learn throughout this term, uh, it's going to be important to know the time and the type of action. 
Today you are learning the present tense verb, which tells us present time continuous action. The other thing is the voice. Now, I want you to notice that, again, coming out of Vera's mouth, you have AMP, the AMPs. And that AMP stands for active, middle, and passive voice, the three different voices that Greek verbs will take and that you will need to be familiar with. Now, in English, we are familiar with two different voices. We are familiar with the active and the passive voice. So looking here for, for Vera, you see in the active voice that the subject does the action. In this case, Vera says, I baptize. And in the English, we have the passive voice. The subject, the subject actually receives the action. I am being baptized. But in Greek, we have a third voice, the middle voice, and that is where the subject does the action in his or her own interest, and that is the middle voice, I baptize for myself. Now, today, you're only going to be learning the active voice, but later on, we'll be introducing you to also the middle and the passive voice. So as we go through the course, being aware of the kind of voice, whether it's the active, the middle, or the passive voice, will be something else you want to keep in mind. But again, for today, you're only going to be dealing with the active. Now, Mir Vera's mood, okay, and her moo moo. Uh, the mood of a verb will tell us how something is done, whether it's a statement of fact or whether it is a probability or a possibility. And so I'm going to introduce you to the four different moods of Vera. There is the indicative mood, and this is the mood that you will only be dealing with for the first term. this first term. You will only be dealing with the indicative mood. That is the statement of fact. I loose the indicator, Lou says there. Notice that on this rather uh, odd-looking uh, machine with steam coming out of it, there is an indicator with the gauge telling Lou exactly what's going on so that he knows the facts of the situation. And that little picture there will help you to remember that the indicative mood tells you the fact. All right, The indicative mood is a statement of fact. Next term, you'll be learning something called the subjunctive mood. Uh, the subjunctive mood tells us about the realm of probability. I may lose the subject. That means Lou may or he may not do this. Uh, and you can see the picture that we have there is a junk ship, a Chinese junk ship, that has been also partially converted into a submarine, and that is the subjunct. Moods, the uh, verb of a mood sometimes can express command. That is the imperative mood. Here, Lou, Lou is giving a command to the chains to loose the imp pair, which will help remind us of the imperative mood. And you've got this little elfish-looking pair there. Finally, the optative mood. This is uh, the realm of possibility or desire, and it's remote. And it says, I may loose the octopus. And the octopus is going to remind you of the optative mood. But again, for this term, the only mood you're going to need to be worried about is the indicative mood. The last part of Vera that we're going to be dealing with, or the part of the verb, is the person and number. All right, the person tells us the, all right, whether it is I, you, he, or we, you, or they. And then the number is going to tell us whether it is singular or plural. Okay, so those are the five parts of the verb, and we'll come back to these again in just a few minutes to show you how they work in relation to Greek. Now, as far as understanding of verbs, a verb actually in Greek can change. All right, it can change just by simply changing its ending. It can change its tense, it can change its voice, its mood, or its person, or its number. Let's take a look and see exactly how this happens. Changing a Greek verb or forming a Greek verb is not unlike buying a car. When you buy a car and you go to see the salesperson, you start off with your basic model, and then you work up from there, including accessories. So for instance, you may start off with your basic model, but perhaps you want to uh, make it look a little nicer, and so you add some additional uh, sporty rims to the car to sort of sharpen it up and give it a different look. In Greek, it's not, it's not all that different. You start off with a stem, 
and you add an ending. Now, let me remind you again that so far in this uh, chapter, all the words that you have learned that have ended in omega, like luo, akuo, hamartano, blepo, all of these are verbs. Now, thinking about luo, who's the verb uh, that we're going to have with us the most, lu, the lambda upsilon, is actually your stem. And what we do in order to change that is we add an ending to it. Now, so far, you have learned the omega, all right? And that is the one of the endings that you're going to be learning. And so lu, the stem, plus an ending, omega, equals luo. I loose or destroy. And so I've actually put the ending in red here to help you to remember that although you learn the omega with the word that you have gotten the vocabulary, whether it's luo, akuo, or blepo, the omega on the end is actually an ending, and the lu, or the stem, is the actual word. And what we're going to do is we're just going to change out the ending in order to make that verb say something different. And there are six different endings that you can actually apply to that verb to actually get it to say different things. And here they are. We have O, or we have ace, and then we have A. That's on the left-hand column, and that is our first, our second, and our third person singular. O, ace, A. All right. And then in the right-hand column, we have the first person plural, the second person plural, and the third person plural. Amen, eta, usi, or usin. And I'll explain that a little bit more in just a moment. So there are six different possible ways that you can end that lu stem. You can be luo, luace, lue, luamen, lueta, luusi, or luusin. It's o. Ace A, Amen Eta Usi. And so let's take a look at how that actually plays out with the verb. Here is your first person singular, Luo. Okay, and that's the way you've learned it, and that is I loose or I am loosing. But if we just simply add the ace ending to the stem instead of the omega, and we have the second person singular, it becomes Luace, which means you loose or you are loosing. Or if we want to add the third person singular, we again take off that omega and we put on the epsilon iota. It becomes lue, he, she, or it looses, all right, or she, he, or it is loosing. And keep in mind, these are present active indicative endings. They tell us that the action is happening now and that it's ongoing. That's why you either say I loose or I am loosing or you loose, or you are loosing. And so again, o, ace, a, or luo, luace, lue, those are the three uh, single endings that you're going to add. If you want, you can pause the video for a moment, look those over, and then begin the video again. Moving on to the plural endings. Again, we start with our stem lu, and we just simply add the endings that we have there. It's lu amen, which means we loose or we are loosing, or the second person plural, lu eta, you loose or you are loosing, or the third person plural, lu usi or lu usin, and I'll explain that little extra new there in just a moment, means they loose or they are loosen. Lu amen, lu eter, lu usin. Let's take a look at the whole paradigm now together. As you look at this, you see all in the black, okay, is the same stem that you learned when you learned luo. And in the red are the six different endings, and they're categorized under either singular or plural, and then first, second, or third person, okay? Luo. Luace, Lue, Lu Amen, Lu Eter, Lu Usi. Again, Luo means I loose. Luace means you singular loose. Lue, he, she, or it looses. On the right hand column, Lu Amen, we loose. Lu Eta, you plural loose. And then Lu Usi or Lu Usin, they loose. Now, let me just say something about that little new that's in the parentheses there. Sometimes, It'll be lu usi, 
in the third person plural. Sometimes it'll be luusin. That is known as the movable new. Now the movable new shows up depending upon whether the word that follows the verb is either beginning with a vowel or a consonant. If it begins with a vowel, it'll be luusin. So if we wanted to say uh, they loose sin, it would be luusin hamartia. Okay. But if it began with a consonant, the next the next uh, word, then it would simply become luusi. I'm not really concerned that you worry about knowing exactly when to put the new on or not because I won't ask you to do that, but you do need to be aware that the movable new will show up and disappear depending upon the word that is following it. It doesn't change anything how you translate this word or how you parse it. It's just a matter of spelling um, and, and pronunciation that the ancient Greeks used. With that in mind, let's take a look at our memory aid for today. Now, as you look at this rather unusual picture, you have Lou, and he's holding a present. And that is to remind you that we are dealing with the present tense, pre present tense and this is present continuous action. And Lou is there loosing the indicator with the wrench. All right, the indicator reminds you that we are dealing with indicative mood, the present tense. And then off to the right, I want you to see that we got an oasis and there is an omelet oozing, oozing out of the pan. Um, and the oasis with the omelet oozing is to remind you of our six different endings that you can put on in the present tense. O, ace, a, amen, eta, usi, or usin, and or just simply Oase amen eta usin. And so the oasis is there uh, with an omelet usin out of the pan. Again, I don't expect you to memorize the actual um, the actual way to uh, do that, but you will actually want to use this memory device to perhaps help you. Now, how do we parse a verb? Okay, that is how do we pick it apart? Because each week uh, I'm going to ask you to identify a verb. I'm going to ask you to run through and identify me the different parts. And so here's Vera here to remind us of the five different parts that we have here. When you look at a verb, I want you to identify the five different parts. I want you to remember that Vera at time is tense. That's why she has the tears. I want you to remember that you need to identify her voice, the AMP, the amps. What kind of a mood is Vera in? And again, for this term, you'll be only dealing with the indicative mood. What person? Is it the first? Is it the second or the third? And then number, is it uh, singular or plural? So let me give you an example. Oh, and that after that, you will be able to translate it. So here's the example. Diokai. Dioke, excuse me, comes uh, from the Greek word dioko. And if I parse it, take a look what I've done here. On the left, you see that I've got PAI3S. Now, I don't want you to say PAI3S. You can write it out like this, but I want you to get in the habit. This is the present active indicative third person singular. Um, the P represents the present, the active represents the active voice, the indicative represents the indicative mood, third person tells us that it's he, she, or it, and then the S tells us that it is singular. So we have present, active, indicative, third person singular, he, she, or it pursues or persecutes, and it comes from the vocabulary word that you learned, dioko. Let's take a look at another word, grapho. This is one of the vocabulary words that you looked at. Now remember that graph is actually the stem. The omega on the end is the ending that tells you how the verb is uh, operating. And so with that in mind, I look at that, I think through my paradigm, o, a, s, a, amen, et, usi, and I parse it, and it, I come up with this present active indicative first person singular I write or you could also say I am writing but you gotta keep in mind this is present tense and it is continuous writing okay continuous action 
Let's take another look at another verb, legace. Now, you learned this, as you remember, as lego, which would have had an omega on the end. You can see here that I have got the uh, ending for you in red, legace, to help you remember. Again, let's go through our paradigm that you need to memorize your endings. It's oase, oh, oase, amen et usi, or usin. Oase, that's the second person singular, oase. And so there it is. Present active indicative, second person singular. You speak, or you could actually say you are speaking. Let's take a look at another one. Pempomen. Pempomen comes from our Greek verb pempo with the omega on the end with the way you learned it. But now as we think through our paradigm for today of the six endings, oase, nope, nothing in there. Amen et usi. Ah, yes, it's the first person plural. Amen et usi. And so we parse it. Present active indicative, first person plural. We send or we are sending. Each time you look at a verb, you simply need to uh, remember how you learned it, look at the ending, and then parse it for you. Let's take a look at a few more. Didaskousin. Didaskousin comes from the Greek word didasko that you learned in your vocabulary this week. Didasko means I teach. You've got an usin on there. You think through your paradigm. Oase, amen et usi or usin. Ah, third person plural, okay? And you want to ask yourself your five questions. Do you want to know the tense, the voice, the mood, the person, your number for our parsing? And in this case, we have a present active indicative third person plural they teach or they are teaching. The nice thing that you can keep in mind for at least this week as you're dealing with your verbs is that the first three parts of your parsing are always going to be the same. It's always going to be present, active, indicative because at this point in the class you don't know the other tenses, you don't know the other voices, nor do you know the other moods. So you can simply start off by putting a P slash a slash I slash and then you need to focus on your person or number and so for at least this week that'll help you along so with that in mind let's take a look at another one annoy gay okay annoy gay comes from annoy go okay uh, which means I open and we go through our paradigm here and we think o ace a oh okay so this is a third person singular so again we already know that it has to be a present active indicative because that's all we know and it's third person singular and so remember the third person singular can be either he she or it opens and so i've chosen to translate this one as she opens, but you could also say he opens or it opens. And I'll help you as we move throughout this course to decide how to know whether it's a she or he or it that is actually doing the action of the verb. Let's look at one last example before I give you your assignment for the week. Doxadzata comes from the Greek word doxadzo. Okay. Uh, Going through our little paradigm again from the present tense endings, o, ace, a, amen, eta, usi. Ah, there it is, the second person plural, amen, eta, second person plural. So we know that this is a present active indicative, second person plural. Okay, and it's you, plural, glorify, or you are glorifying. Okay, so for your preparation for Wednesday's class. This is what you need to do. You, you need to read over chapter one, take notes on it, and take note of any questions you may have and bring those to class. Uh, I need you to memorize as best you can to your ability the chapter one vocabulary words that we have for this week. Of particular importance is that you memorize the present active indicative endings. That was Oase, amen, et, usi endings. 
and then I want you to complete the chapter one parsing practice that's in the workbook. Okay, that is uh, that additional parsing practice and sentence translation workbook that you also received when you bought your uh, book here. I want you to go into that workbook, okay, and I would like you to work on at least 10 of those parsing practices for chapter one. And then when you come to class on Wednesday, we will go over questions and the lesson together, and we'll work on the rest of the uh, practice sentences that you didn't do in class. Look forward to seeing you then when we get to class.